Welcome to another episode of The Impact of AI, sponsored by AI Time Journal and supported by WILDA, Women Leaders in Data and Artificial Intelligence. Each week we explore how AI and cognitive technologies impact us daily, both professionally and personally. For those of you whom I've not met yet, my name is Melissa Drew and I will be your host for this week's podcast. This week is gonna be really exciting. We have for us Maria Nazareth, she is currently the VP of Business and Technology Financial Services at Cognizant. Cognizant is a digital leader for financial services in client management and consulting. In her role today, she focuses on how to leverage software and data and Internet of Things and AI and machine learning and analytics and data, all of that to help her work with her customers and clients in that digital transformation journey. Maria, welcome. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you for having me here today. I always like to start the first question with the journey. We, we always recognize that no one's journey today is ever a direct path. And as I'm looking at LinkedIn, because I tend to do that a lot, as I'm looking at LinkedIn, you have a degree in physics. So absolutely, we are going to go back to the very early stages of your journey and understand how you went from physics to digital transformation. It was, a, it was definitely an interesting journey. I'm actually a physics major and a math minor, oh. and my grad degree is in computer science, and I guess that, that sort of sums me up. So anything that is got to do with analytics and logical thinking is mm-hmm. what I love to do. And um, even though quantum physics was was my favorite part of physics in, in college. Uh, the part that really got me excited was chip programming, believe it or not. And that sort of led to doing more computer programming and realizing that that's where I belong. Huh. So I'm among those few people who started out their journey in the data world. I knew right at the onset that's who I am. Um, and my first job out of school at PwC was in their data management uh, service line, as we used to call it. Mm -hmm. And ever since then, I've never looked back. So 20 years later, still doing data, still doing analytics, and, uh, you know, now doing AI. Maria, your role at Cognizant is working in a combination of Internet of Things, data, artificial intelligence, um, machine learning. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things that, that you really use as tools when you're working with your clients, what is it you do today in, in bringing your value? So the one, the thing that wakes me up every morning, mm-hmm. right? Every morning you get up at five and you want to go, you want to go back to work immediately is the ability to help our clients make better decisions and faster, right? And why this is so important today is because Excellent customer service is no longer a nice to have, right? It is a must. Um, And if you look at the surveys, 70% of people say customer experience is a key factor in how they determine who they're going to do business with. Mm -hmm. And what we do is enable all these different pieces of data, right? Data that the the banks have, data that the insurance companies have, external data, what you can buy and combine it all together really quickly to provide that ex- that best in the world experience for their customers and for their employees, right? So how do you enable your bank or your insurance company to provide better services? That's what it all comes down to at the end of the day, making informed decisions faster. That's in, in a nutshell, if I have to say it in, in one sentence, that's what we do. Now, the technology pieces of it are the easy piece, pieces of it, and combining all this different type of data and technology and getting them to work together is, is, the, is the fun part. But at the end of the day, that's why you do what you do, to, to make it a better experience for your employees and for your customers. So if I, if I look at the broader perspective, I know I've got the data. You know, the, the whole program of collecting the data, getting the data in the right format, the infrastructure, et cetera. Then there's this, multi, you know, this, this middle phase, which is pulling in, you know, building, building the prototype, 
understanding how we're going to do the proof of concept, making sure that we're meeting the outcomes of that business. And then typically there's the kind of the third phase, which is moving that into an, a production or operationalizing or, or scaling. Where do you feel that, that you tend to fit in, 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 in any of those areas? Um, act, actually, in all of those areas. Okay. And, and the, way, uh, the way I think of it is the data journey or the AI journey or the analytics journey, depending on whether you're trying to modernize your data, whether you're trying to modernize your cloud environment to get all your data in one place, whether, so you then modernize your data and then do advanced analytics or AI on it or machine learning models on it. Mm-hmm. All of it is a journey. And as you think about moving down that path, it has to be a journey. It has to be a roadmap that you put in place. And the way we like to think of it, uh, the way I like to think of it is in uh, six steps, right? So the first one is to develop your strategy. So shift from just building capabilities to being a data-driven company. Mm -hmm. right, or being a technology-driven company and addressing how are you going to execute it. So it's not only the why, why you're going to do it. It's also how are you going to execute on your strategy. You talked about um, having the right processes in place, right, having uh, your DevOps, your MLOps in place so you can expedite that journey. That That is one, that's the first step. Mm -hmm. The second step is use case driven processes, right? So focus on the business value of your use cases and invest in the diverse capabilities. It's not a one uh, shoe fits all, right? So Mm -hmm. there are diverse AI capabilities instead of just focusing on AI solutions. So focus on which use cases provide you the best value and the step three, which a lot of companies um, don't necessarily do, they will take a use case and then they'll they'll take off is, but experiment with the prototypes, right? Use a prototype to lay a foundation and then prepare for a strategic alignment. This is important because it enables you to start small, fail small, but scale big right? Everyone, as they start through this journey, just like as we were children and we were learning to walk, everyone has, has a fall. So, so fail small and then scale big, right? Like that. Uh, yeah. The third one, uh, the fourth step, the way I look at it is build with confidence, right? So as the industry is emerging, uh, today technology is changing at a faster pace than it did at least 20 years ago when I started out. So um, don't, don't have a, you have to have a growth mindset and not a reactive mindset, right? So focus on risk, focus on ethics. Um, ethical AI is something that, uh, that is big in today's world. So how do you use your data to make ethical decisions? Right. Mm-hmm. So so build with that confidence, build with those ethics and um, values. Right. The fifth step is to scale for enterprise deployment. Right. So I talked about doing doing prototypes, starting small and then scaling big, but ensure that you can do this at an enterprise level. Right. So uh, shift from your rigid technologies to more adaptive technologies, more adaptive processes operating models that bring about a nimbleness across the organization. And the sixth one uh, is how do you go beyond implementing just AI to discovering new capabilities? So I started out with saying, this is a journey. Mm-hmm. And you know, as you are going down the path, your destination keeps evolving. The outcomes you want to bring about keep evolving how you want to bring them about keeps evolving because technology changes Mm -hmm. so um understand that it's a journey and keep evolving i want to go back and focus i really like the the fail small and scale big i i love that concept if i'm out there thinking okay I've, i've got my i've got my data i've got my infrastructure i've 
I've got my prototype. I know that I'm at least getting to the point where I needed to go. What are some of the barriers or challenges you're seeing in, in the companies trying to, trying to scale, trying to get beyond that prototype or beyond that proof of concept stage? Banks and financial institutions in particular have an interesting challenge today, mm -hmm. right? Um, they are trying to compete, and some of them successfully are, with the fintechs and the insure techs of the world. But yet they are held true through the regulatory institutions that they have to follow certain rules, mm -hmm. right? And, and that balancing act is, is a tough one uh, for in, in this particular industry itself. Uh, some of the challenges we see is a lot of the financial institutions have their legacy data on legacy technology, right? So they've invested a lot in their mainframes or, or other, other older data storage and data access solutions. So they first have to do a transformation journey to get their data to a place where they can use it. Mm -hmm. And with that comes a bunch of challenges, right? And the way I think about data modernization is like if you're moving a house, if you lived in a townhouse and you're moving to a single family home, you can move one of two ways. A is you take everything from your townhouse to your single family home because your single family home is bigger. And so once you move to your single family home, you can sort out what you want to keep and what you don't want to keep. And the second one is you clean up your townhouse while you're living there and you only move what you want to move, right? So if I use that same analogy, moving forward to the data world, so you have your data on these older systems and you not all your data is pristine. Not all your data has DQ checks on it. Not, you don't have master data for everything. You don't have metadata for everything. So how do you just move all your data? Do you do a lift and shift or do you do a transformation, right? And uh, I'm the latter. And, I'm the latter example, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, and it's, again, it depends, right? It depends on what are those use cases you want to build. At the end of the day, is why are you doing this, right? Got it. And so I, and I have personally done both routes multiple times mm -hmm. and good decisions for, for those different scenarios. But it, those, that's a challenge, right? So how do you know what to move? And then once you move it and you get it combined, one of the biggest challenges I had when I first did this for the first time with this scale of data is how do you show data traceability? Because mm. remember, these are financial institutions. Tra traceability is important, right? How do you show data traceability? How do you have that single source of truth and you try everything back to the first producer of data? How do you ensure quality? Um, how do you actually give your data a data quality score, a DQ score? How much do, can you trust this data, Mr. Consumer, right? Right. Um, and then not all data is equal. So um, data should also have an IQ score, right? So which data are you going to spend more time on getting clean, getting traced, having the best metadata and master data, right? And then now that you have all this data, right? And you need your DevOps and you need your MLOps, right? To get, get there faster. And now you're building new applications, new analytics based on this data. So how do you productionize it faster, right? That is one of the really big challenges the, uh, people face. How do you scale it, right? Yeah. Given, given, of course, the technology changing and stuff like that. And, um, and how do you bring value out of your data sooner? So that, that's why it comes back to the six things I was talking about, Melissa, which is identify why you want to do it, identify your use cases, and then start your journey, right? You should always know why you want to do it and then, then use, use that to drive your rationale behind the process. Mm -hmm. I, I tell all my clients this, never do it for the sake of doing it, right? Uh, uh, doing data modernization or doing cloud modernization because it's the next big thing in the industry. Oh, it was at least five years ago. And I don't think it's the next big thing. It's here to stay. <laughs> but it's, it's totally not worth it. You're not going to save time. You're not going to save money. Uh, do it because you want to provide value to your customer, to your employee at the end of the day. Figure out what value you want to pro provide 
prioritize those and then start the journey. You mentioned earlier that the goal is to help to help people, to help organizations make, and I'm going to paraphrase, make better informed decisions, which ultimately the way I understand that or interpret that is in order for me to make a better informed decision, I need to have the right data at the right time so that I can make that decision that's going to impact me now versus I can have the right data at the right time, but if it's not the data that's going to impact that decision, then I'm still missing, you know, missing a component. So as, as I listen to this and I'm thinking about that in the back of my head, this journey sounds, sometimes it sounds very lengthy. And if I'm an organization that needs to hurry up and get the right data at the right time so I can make a better informed decision that's going to impact me the most, wow, like what do we say to these organizations that, hey, I want to get, I know what I want to do. I want to get there. This is what I want to do. Why are you telling me that it's going to take so long to do this? So the one thing I believe Mm -hmm. is when you're doing this, it's very important to do it right. Okay. Especially in the industry that I spend a lot of my time in, right? Uh, there's, There's a reason we have regulations in place. And so it is very important to do it right. Um, it is a journey. Uh, some people's journeys are longer and some mm-hmm. people's journeys are shorter. And um, the, that's why it all comes back to what I, uh, to those use cases, right? So if, if we were having this conversation and you, know, you want to get there sooner, I would ask you, what is the problem you're trying to solve, right? Okay. What, what is it that you are trying to bring value to to your employees or to your customer, right? And um, in the banking industry, we usually see uh, five categories, right? One is in the customer experience space because it is very, very expensive to lose a customer. So how do you retain your customers? How do you upsell? How do you cross sell? How do you anticipate their needs and how like, how do you do personalized money, money management to, for them, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's, don't, don't treat them generically. The second one is um, optimizing how you do things, right? So conversational AI is another huge, huge area that I think almost every bank has in place right now, right? Where you, you can have a live chat with, with a robot, not necessarily a human being. And that also goes from one end to the other, including doing voice analysis, emotion analysis, so that the robot can actually deal with you faster and is augmented with other data that they know about you, right? So if you had a late credit card payment and you were calling about that, the robot should already know that and and be able to communicate with you that way. Or um, finding out patterns and things like that. Uh, The third one we see is underwriting, right? So how do you automate underwriting? Uh, How do you use RPAs and ML models uh, using different varied data sources, including NLP and reading documents uh, faster to be able to automate that loan process? Mm -hmm. Honestly, in my ideal world, I should be able to go online, fill up a little data, whatever data saying I want this kind of a loan, um, hopefully have a, a facial recognition system that they would look at my face and within two to three minutes, my loan should be approved or not approved, right? Because <laughs> think about it. Oh my God, that'd be awesome. <laughs> yeah, so, but, but I think that's where, that's where this one is going, right? We, uh, instead of us taking a month to close on a house, we can all close on it in five minutes. That would be really nice. Um, the fifth area is collections, right? Uh, how do you actually create strategies on collections? Because um, to leverage, you can leverage data, first of all, on your customers to prevent getting to the collection stage, right? Prevent your customer from being delinquent. You you know, the banks know your bank accounts there, your credit cards payments there. If you're missing payments, the bank knows. So the bank knows that you probably need a little help right and how can they help you at that point of time you in particular you right the person not a collective Mm -hmm. to enable you to move on from that situation and god forbid you have actually got into collections 
who are the people who are actually estimated to pay back versus those who are not where do you really want to est- spend your money on on recovering bad debt and where you don't think you'll get a return right mm-hmm. so that's that's the fourth area and then of course since it's a financial uh, sector it is the the fifth area is in the regulatory and risk assessment so leverage ai to automate labor intensive processes right and ensure that you're meeting regulatory compliance like kyc and also be aware of the new ones that are coming so you're prepared for it right so these are the usual use cases and most most of our clients would pick a particular category and then in that category we would figure out which one is going to benefit them the most right okay. so a retail bank versus a commercial bank versus an investment bank versus a life insurance uh company right all of them have different use cases that are very particularly tuned to them and they they have different prioritizations depending on company strategy so we would start with the number one and then we would start small we would start with a subset right and see how it works and then scale up so if if you only have to do one or two things right if your 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 focus is on one or two of these areas your journey is much smaller however if you are a large multinational bank mm-hmm. um the journey is 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 much longer and the journey is longer because it's uh, you want to do it right either to keep keep uh, provide better experience to your customers and employees or because you need to do it to stay relevant right and for banks it's it's a particular hard time uh, because not only do they have to um compete with the you know fintechs of the world but they also have to compete with tech companies that are eating into their space right i i read an interesting article the other day and and i really hope this fact is wrong but the article said people have more money in their starbucks accounts than they do in their savings accounts oh no and 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 i thought about it and i think so starbucks is a bank technically right now yeah. i mean a coffee shop but if they have more money than people do in the same account then it's turned into a bank right so how do banks stay relevant and improve that customer experience is very important and it's it's more difficult for them because i don't know when was the last time you went to the bank lisa but i haven't been to my bank for like years i haven't right? written a check no either and in- I wrote a check 4 years ago. Yeah. Everything, you yeah. know, digital, everything's yeah, everything's on my app. Um uh, mobile, you know, checking where I do the deposits, um uh, transfer money online, uh Zell, yeah. I'm using Zell, uh Venmo. Yeah. I yeah, I haven't been to a bank, a physical bank in a, in a very very long time. All right. And and so at least when we used to go into the bank you would meet the teller you would meet the bank manager you had that relationship yeah now everything's virtual so it's it's difficult for them to to keep their customers to so they have to be really innovative which is why their journey is not a one or two step journey and it's a longer journey but it's worth it the roi is is there uh we see we we have we, like i've seen some amazing stories on how much money bank a uh, so, like a certain credit card company that we were working with uh they were able to optimize their fraud detection mm-hmm. to a to a certain percentage and I, i uh that they were able to give money back to their customers right so oh, they wow. they basically took out the card fees because they said you know we the, they optimized their systems that's all they did but they were able to provide a better customer experience right and and the roi is there it's worth the investment and and think about it right if your credit card company basically says i'm no longer going to charge you for the card it's free you're going to stay with them yeah oh i would i i would i'm i'm trying to think <laughs> in my head who is that <laughs> <laughs> yeah but, but but I get to see these stories and work on them on a first hand basis and and that's just exciting to me. No, that's great. I I I'm much more interested in fraud detection and banking today than I probably have been in a, in quite a while. I I love what I what I heard from you today that I really like is that when we talk about AI journey, yes, I I see where you prioritize i love the use cases that you used 
we pick something, we focus on it, we move on. But I'm also recognizing that our, our economic landscape is constantly changing. Our technology footprint is constantly changing. Our consumer demand and what they want today is also constantly changing. And I think what I've really understood in, in talking today is that our AI journey is not short or long. Our AI journey is a continuous journey, a continuous health check and review and optimize and add and adjust. And I think that was, um, I think that was a really good point to make. I don't know if you meant to make that, but I, that's what I got from the conversation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I think you hit the nail on the head. And uh, it, it's the way I think of it. And I'm going to get philosophical here. It's much like life. Mm -hmm. If you are not learning and growing every day, you're not living. And, yeah. and you're not trying to get better as an institution, as a company. You're going to be a dinosaur someday. And and we this this time is so. It's it's a wonderful time because we have the technology and the ability to combine all this data to provide information and and just make life easier, right? For everyone, like things that used to take days, now we can do them in minutes, right, or seconds. I um, love so. the I love the happy stories. Do you have another story? Um, I love the stories. Do you have another one? So the, I don't know whether this is a happy story, but this is a true story. Okay. <laughs> all the <time>. Okay. Um, <laughs> Um, we were, I, it was a brand new bank, a new client of us and me and another individual, we went to meet the CEO, right. And we, we were going to talk about their strategy, uh, where, you know, where the bank wanted to be in five years and how we could help them get mm -hmm. to that point. Right. And, um, my colleague, um, he whipped out his, his credit card. Right. And he said, you know what? I have been a customer of this bank for 15 years and in my head I'm thinking oh my god where is this going <laughs> and you know I have bank accounts here I have a credit card here use my credit card like here's my proof my wife and I have been customers for 20 years right and he said in these 20 years y'all know that I have two children my daughter turned 18 six months ago y'all are the only bank that did not send her a, her, a credit card offer <gasps> Okay, and, and, you know, he said, this is my credit score. We have been loyal customers. You, you, you know, we have always paid our bills on time. We are the type of customers you want to have and keep, right? right? And he said, yet y'all did not send my daughter a credit card offer. And this is why you need to integrate your systems <laughs> so that you can actually provide better customer experience. And... You know, I, I looked at him and I was like, wow, that was cool. That was a story, Bold. right? That's yeah. Cool. But um, but those are, and, and of course the CEO was, um, he, he, he looked at me and he said, okay, you know what? You guys have made your point. Now, how do you want to do this, right? And and, yeah. and so we, we brainstormed. But but that's that's exactly why data and analytics and, and doing it the right way is important. Right. And, and something that um, institutions don't realize is so if a bank, let's take a retail bank, for example, they have savings, they have some commercial, they have credit cards, they have a few aspects of it. Right. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, in the past, when they built it, they built silos. In fact, you would have a, in this retail bank, you'd have a commercial CIO, you'd have a um, credit card CIO, you would have a home loan CIO, right? The interesting part is the data that was generated by the credit card business was used more by the, like the savings, the retail piece of it mm -hmm. than by the credit card business because it had them make better decisions, right? Okay. And so the, the ability we have today to tie all this data through is, is um, really good. Oh, and I do have a happy story for you. Oh, we like um, that. Yes. Yeah, I do have a happy story for you. So I was sitting down in the airport, okay? And um, I love talking to strangers, okay? I've done a whole, I've done a show on why one should talk to strangers. <laughs> but I was sitting down at the airport and there was this really nice elderly woman sitting down next to me. 
and mm-hmm. we got talking we got chatting and she asked me what i did and so i just you know, i told her i said i work in technology i work in the data field and you know we we build all these applications and reports and things based on data that help you you know to uh, you know do things faster and better she's like oh you work for a bank and among the really which bank this is but she said oh i love this bank how how do you work with this bank and i said yeah yeah actually it's one of my favorites and she says oh wait i have to show you something so she whips out her cell phone and okay. she pulls up the app okay and she says you know what um when i used to lose my credit card and she said you know i'm getting older i sometimes forget my credit card yeah. she, uh, like she's she, it's a real or, like we're having this conversation she's and so when i used to lose my credit card they would have to cancel it and then i'd have to wait for like a week for someone to send me a new card in the mail right and she says now all i have to do is freeze my credit card on a press of a button and while i'm waiting for my new card to arrive i can freeze it so nobody else can use my card in case it's you know stolen or fraud or whatever yeah but if i need to use it in case of an emergency i can press another button and unfreeze it use it and freeze it immediately again she said isn't that wonderful and i thought about it and i was like huh not bad at all <laughs> not bad at all like we made a difference to the way um she thought about a credit card company right and she said i didn't have to pay extra for this it was it was on but she was so excited i'm i'm telling you that it was it was a long week it was a friday evening flight back home but you know i just that conversation made me feel so good about what i did that's awesome um, cuz you know it's interesting cuz I, i you know you talk about the use cases and i'm sitting here listening to this conversation and if somebody would just break down all the interactions and touch points that we have with our customers that's such a small touch point if you look at the larger picture but it's the one that's so frustrating and especially if you know you're out there you know traveling and you need somebody to get you the card you know in less than 24 hours because you kind of have to use it to fly home i mean absolutely yeah, yeah. no that's that's yeah i you love your job i can totally tell i, <laughs> I do i i am um you know actually i was watching to a linkedin post which they uh, which said everyone should love your job but yeah. i i i really believe i'm among the lucky few that landed in in an area that i'm just so passionate about it's it's something i i thoroughly enjoy and um and what uh, yeah, and what you know uh what i i really spend a lot of time doing mm-hmm. is also mentoring younger women into okay. in this right so i i try to give some of my passion back uh because um you know this only 8.1 oh this year we had the highest number of women ceos in the fortune 500 companies at a whopping 8.1% right 47% wow. of our workforce is women but only 8.1% ceos right mm-hmm. and and it's the same thing in the technology field so it's a i feel if you can just impact the the young women around you i you know I, of course i'm a i'm a member of builder but even at cognizant i run the women's tech for for ai so you know encouraging mentoring young women um in particular right i have two boys nothing against the boys <laughs> uh, but uh, but you know young women in particular to have more of them join the ranks is is something i'm really passionate about and i i i really hope i i i you know 20 years later 30 years or 40 years later whenever whenever i retire i see some other young women as passionate about this and i was able to contribute to that a bit absolutely that passion i can easily see it being transferred to anyone that that comes around you and talks to you like i did today yeah thank you it's awesome unfortunately we are coming we are wrapping up this this was so great i loved sharing stories um but we do have to wrap it up because we can't talk forever what are some things that that you want to you know last minute kind of lessons learned here's some advice things to think of um you mentioned that you've been mentoring women is there something specific that maybe you could share you know before we leave today 
So from a mentoring women perspective, mm -hmm. uh, I truly believe the way to make an impact or to make a difference and to have more younger women join this field, right? This, this is an awesome field, is to be able to get out there and talk to them about okay. it, right? Provide it as a career option. This is a true career option. It's not nerdy. It's not <laughs> difficult, right? It's, it's cool. Some of the things you do are really cool. And to be able to provide them that perspective and get uh, young women involved sooner than later, um, we, we, you know, there's girls who code, women who code, there are lots of organizations. Um, so get young women involved a lot more earlier in life. I think that is key for us. Mm -hmm. uh, and honestly, it is key for us to stay globally competitive uh, as a country. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Perfect. Well, that was uh, was perfect to end to end on. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for for joining me. I know it was difficult with the calendars, but this was absolutely worth it. Thank you so much, Melissa. I do appreciate your time and the invitation.